you're listening to the Raising Family Podcast with your hosts, David Steele and Linda Hill. Brought to you by thefamilyproclamation.org. Hello and welcome to the Raising Family Podcast. I'm your host, David Steele, along with co-host Linda Hill. And today we are blessed to have Jeff Carney here with us. And uh, Jeff and Linda actually know each other. So I'm actually just going to have Linda introduce him because she probably knows a lot more than I do. Well, and I'm really just going to give a brief introduction because I'd like Jeff to tell us more about himself. But um, Jeff uh, serves in uh, young single adult bishopric. Uh, we're working with him right now in that. And he works for Covey Institute teaching the seven habits in prisons. And I have been intrigued to know more about this for a long time. And we feel that there's some things that he can share with us today that very much fit in with uh, things that we're learning about in the family proclamation. That'll be super cool. Um, So to get started, I think we'll just let you kind of introduce yourself a little more and talk about, you know, we kind of have you on this podcast because you have an interesting job and the thing that you do. And it's it's really interesting. I think we're going to learn a lot about it today. So maybe just give us your background and why you were led to do what you do. Yeah, I'll do that. Absolutely. I, uh, my name is Jeff, Jeff Carney, as David mentioned, and I work for Franklin Covey. And basically what we do is we do leadership development. We help people improve their lives to become more productive and so forth. But I have got the most incredible, unique, wonderful job in the world. I love it. (laughs) It's really, uh, it's really unique in that what I do is I go, I lead our corrections effort. We have a program called the seven habits on the inside. And what that means is we go into prisons, we go into jails and basically change lives and help these men and women that have really lost their way to find a new way and a better way to live. And so I've been doing it now. I've I've been with Franklin Covey 32 years, but doing the corrections thing and this effort for 22, 23 years how I got into it, I, I really honestly believe that I was led there and, and really just blessed to be there. But there were small steps that happened long ago, about 23 years ago, when you know I met one of the directors of prisons within Colorado, and he oversaw all the prisons there within the state. And we were doing some leadership development for his executive team. His name was Jerry Gasco, just a, truly a great man. And after doing this training, he turned to his executive team and he said, well, why don't we take this to the inmates, referring to the seven habits? And they all laughed. They thought that, you know, he was he was somehow joking. But once you know, Jerry, he wasn't joking about it at all. And so what happened is over the next three years, we began an experiment of taking the seven habits of highly effective people to inmates And so it really was just the adventure and one that I feel like I was so led and guided to be a part of. And now it is genuinely a a tremendous blessing in my life. I've had some incredible experiences meeting all sorts of different types of people, uh, as you could guess. Wow. And I think, I think, you know, from just from what you're saying, I think inherently, uh, You probably understand this part of the proclamation very well. We're going to talk about paragraph two. Um, And I'm just going to read it really quickly. Um, And then we will jump into a little bit more about how these connect and and a little bit more of the work that you do. Um, So I'll just read that. It's all human beings, male and female, are created in the image of God. Each is a beloved spirit, son or daughter of heavenly parents. And as such, each has a divine nature and destiny. I think that's that's really the sentence that we're going to focus on. I think that you um, can probably feel a lot about, you know, feel a lot of that truth that every person has a divine nature and a divine destiny. Um, and so I think maybe just to to start us off here going, I mean, when you first started doing this, were there some, uh, you know, fears or concerns you had to overcome, you know, to feel comfortable doing this? And, and kind of how did that play out? Yeah, no doubt. In fact, uh, you know, most people have never been in a prison Thankfully, <laughs> we hope that they haven't. <laughs> they haven't also been in a jail or anything like that. And the very first time I went to a prison, it was so unique. It was at Fremont Correctional Facility in Canyon City, Colorado. And when you go into a prison, the very first thing they do is, of course, they make sure you have no 
strange or forbidden objects that come into the prison. You can't bring your keys. You can't bring your cell phone. Uh, you can bring a book. You can bring your planner or something like that. But everything gets left behind. And it is truly just you. So besides going through the metal detector, the, the next experience you have is, you know, someone will always escort you. And then a heavy metal or steel door will slowly open. You'll walk into a very small cubicle. And then the door, this heavy steel door, will close behind you. And there you are at the midst or at the mercy of anybody to, uh, to go anywhere. And you're not going anywhere unless someone lets you go somewhere. And so you wait there for a time until the correctional officer decides, yeah, you can go forward. So another heavy steel door opens, and then you go to another section of the prison. And it really, it goes like that section by section by section until you finally get to wherever you're going. And that very first time that I went in there, of course, I had some trepidation, a little bit of concern. You never know who you're going to meet. You get all the stereotypical <laughs> images from movies, you know, of what these men and these women look like. And frankly, uh, some of them really look that part. You know, they've got <laughs> tattoos beyond belief. I've never seen so many tattoos in my life and in so many unique places. But, you know, that's kind of a, another story. But uh, so the very first time I went to the prison into Fremont, we got back into this one area where they hold all the programming, you know, all the training for the inmates. And as we got there, um, I walked in and it was a group of about 30 inmates. They're all dressed in green. I had no idea what to expect, but I made one right move. I just decided I'm just going to be me. I'm going to be warm. I'm going to be open and try to be as genuine as I can be, despite feeling a little bit nervous on the inside. And what happened is I was going in to teach one of the habits. And what they had done is they'd set all these tables up into a rectangular formation with no opening. And for myself, that's so awkward because you want to walk in and out amongst these people. And so the very first thing I did is I asked, is there any way we can move one end of these tables so I can go in and out? Well, what that conveyed to them, and I had no idea at the time, but what that conveyed to these men was, hey, he's not afraid of us. He wants to be amongst us. And so mm -hmm. it just sent a really clear message. And I've come to find out one thing in all of my journeys throughout the United States, throughout the world with prisons, and it's this. They're the most appreciative group of people that I have ever met in my life. They are so grateful for anybody to come and see them because often they are, they are genuinely the forgotten segment of our society. So it's unique, you know, every time you go in, but uh, now it's, it's become old hat and it's just a joy to be there. Wow. That's I, that I, I love your description of it because I think we all do have those movie images for sure in our you mind. Do. And you know, even as you're telling me these things, I'm getting a little nervous as that big door shutting behind you. Thinking, it's a little nerve wracking <laughs> because you but, know, you're not going anywhere. And, you know, most of the times in a prison, you're on one side, walking on one side of the hall and mm -hmm. they offenders will be on the other side, but in other prisons that aren't as secure, and don't have as great of protocols, they're mixing every which way. And so if you're not used to it, they can sense it immediately. And they can sense immediately if you've got any trepidation or, or any fear. And so I've just come to believe, boy, just love them. And come to know that they really are children of God completely. Well, so that brings me to a question. Um, that uh, That's always on my mind, because, you know, when we do believe that we all make mistakes. Right. And then there's there these 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 are people that literally have had a judgment put upon them. Right. They're they serving <laughs> they're serving time for a reason. They've had some judgment. You know, the law has has come down on them. And I, I guess I'd love to talk a little bit about um, 
you know, we live in this world. Don't judge. Don't judge. Don't judge. Um, but sometimes, you know, we, we maybe confuse a little bit of like judging and discernment. And sometimes when there's been trust that has been seriously broken. I mean, a lot of these people are in there because they seriously broke someone's trust. Um, yeah. Some have caused harm to other people. And and so we know we're supposed to love everybody. And then there's just so many mixed messages, I guess. Maybe can you talk a little bit about you know, judging versus discerning and, and, and how we show love when, when trust has been broken Definitely. and keep ourselves safe as well. Cause there's a matter of personal safety sometimes with there people is. that have and broken, violated trust. Mm -hmm. And you should be concerned about your safety when you're in a prison. Now, typically you're with officers and you're surrounded by them and, you know, the inmates generally are not going to be harmful at all. In fact, most of them are terrific. But I'll share one experience with you that I had in going to uh, Lyman Correctional Facility. It's on the Eastern Plains of Colorado, and this was still kind of in the beginning. I think we'd been running the program about six, seven years. And Lyman is one of those interesting prisons where, you know, the warden there at the time used to call it gladiator school. And what he meant by that was, He's got offenders that are either going to what they call ad, ad seg, it's 23 hour lockdown. You know, these are the worst of the worst inmates, or they're coming back from ad seg and they're literally getting back into the population. This was a medium security prison, but really um, a high level security, one level above medium. And so what happened was this. I went in and I was just giving a, a talk or a speech at one of their seven habit graduations. And I went through the whole rigmarole of getting into the prison, finally getting to the actual location, the room. And there were some inmates milling about. And there were, of course, officers. I happened to be with the warden and we were talking. And when I noticed there was one inmate near the top of the uh, really where all the projection equipment was, where the podium was and so forth. And I thought, I'll just go talk with them, which is kind of my style and see how he's doing. I could only see him from a distance, but I could tell that he was really tatted up, you know, anywhere and everywhere. <laughs> but I decided I'll just go up to him, see how he's doing. And so I did. And as I got closer, I realized that this was the most tattooed man I'd ever seen in my life. He had not only all of his arms, completely covered all of his hands, including the palm of his hands, which that usually isn't the case, but he also had his complete neck covered and all of his face, except the very small round of his face around his eyes, going down his cheeks and then down to his chin. It was just a circle that was not covered, but was what was really completely interesting. And, and he looked like the typical inmate mm -hmm. had long blonde hair but what was really interesting is I got closer to him and approached him to see how he was and just introduced myself. I noticed that not only was his face completely tattooed, but his eyeballs, the whites of his eyes were completely tattooed black. <gasps> Whoa. Now you can imagine you've all seen horror movies and alien movies and you see these aliens that have these completely white eyes and they're just glowing. Well, mm -hmm. these were just the opposite. They were completely black. Wow. And I could not tell if he was looking at me or not, you know, because they completely matched the, the pupils of his eyes. And so it was really, it kind of caught me off guard. I've never seen that before. I've never I've seen even heard of, of that. Tattoos, but, but not the white of their eyes and the irises being tattooed black. And so I began a conversation with them and I thought, wow, this is interesting He's what we consider a core group inmate, which helps lead and in many instances even teach the seven habits on the inside. And so we had a wonderful conversation. Again, all the time I'm wondering, is he really looking at me? I'm really going to tell. <laughs> That's crazy. Except that his face was generally pointed towards me. And then I went back. We did a few more preparations. And then unbeknownst to me, he was one of the speakers on the program along with me. And, you know, I did my part and then it turned the time over to him and him, he being a core group member, one of these key leaders of the seven habits began to speak. I'll just say this. It was the sweetest, most tender talk 
or speech that I've ever heard from any inmate. Wow. I had completely misjudged him and misjudged the book by its cover. You know, the old adage, don't judge a book by its cover. And I quickly realized, wow, how wrong I was. He looked like the typical inmate, the stereotypical inmate, but on the inside of him, he was anything but that. The most tender, humble, changed man that I think I've ever met through all my years of working within corrections. And it, and it really reminded me of, you know, that scripture uh, in Samuel, I think it's first Samuel 16 or somewhere in that range where, you know, Samuel is trying to choose who the next prophet would be. And of course, it's going to be David. But they're looking at one of David's brothers and the Lord tells him not to look on his outward countenance and that the Lord really does look on our inward self and on our hearts, whereas man always looks on the outward appearance. And so, hmm. you know, just to, not to share too much, but just to say that I've really come to know that they're redeemable, that they have great worth, and that they too, like each of us, are sons. They're sons of a father, you know, that really is in heaven and genuinely cares and sons and daughters of heavenly parents. So, you know, just a small example, but that's been repeated several times, maybe not quite to that degree. Hmm. Wow. And that's kind of a, you know, I guess you could kind of call that an aha moment that you had in seeing the worth of souls um, and not judging by the outward appearance and really looking on on the heart um, and understanding divine potential and divine destiny. Um and maybe, you know, just out of curiosity, what are some of the things you've seen uh, while you've visited um, with inmates as to some of their aha moments? What are the, what are some of the things that, that you've seen them learn um, that have kind of changed their perspective and changed their lives? You know, I think the biggest thing that I've seen is that they've come to the conclusion that there's hope for them and that they're actually valued. You know, they are a group of people that often they get no visits. They have no visits from family members and largely because they've betrayed the trust. But not only have we thrown away this segment of our, our population, you know, as a society, but we've thrown them away as family members. And so I found that I found that it gives them hope that they, too, are important, that they're valued. They quickly learn to know that there is a God and that someone actually cares about them. I've always believed that the seven habits on the inside, and you know, I don't want to be uh, silly in saying this, but I mean it with all my heart. I think it takes them one step closer to the gospel, to accepting Christ, mm -hmm. accepting uh, truly the restored gospel. It may not be in this life, but I believe it will definitely be at some point because it, it humbles them and it lets them know that they're valued. Yeah, for sure. And I think maybe on the other hand, I mean, what do you think maybe are, are one or two of the, the biggest, you know, obstacles to them, you know, and to us, to everyone, to, you know, understanding that we do have divine potential and then progressing? Yeah, you know... For them, it's just having that hope at first. But then secondly, and hopefully this makes sense, but it's taking responsibility. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is, you know, and I don't want to share all the habits with you. I won't do that. But the first habit is called be proactive. And, and all it really means is this. Take responsibility for your lives. Mm -hmm. You know, no more excuses, no more victim mindset. No more blaming everybody and anybody who you can. To give you an example of that, most of the inmates, when they come into the program, they, uh, you know, they're blaming anybody and everybody but themselves. Hmm. And so they blame the judge. They blame the jury. They blame uh, the arresting officer. Gosh, they blame their parents. They blame God. They blame uh, anybody but themselves. And so the biggest point and the biggest aha is when, you know, we're really teaching 
habit one about taking responsibility for their lives and uh, changing it because they're the only ones who actually can do it. Then you see a huge aha when they realize, you know what? I put myself here. It's nobody else's fault. It's not my family's fault. It's not my parents' fault. It's not the CEO's fault. By that, I mean correctional officers. It is wholly my fault. And if anything is going to change, it's going to start with me, but it's going to start on the inside and quit placing blame everywhere. And so I found that in terms of the gospel, you know, ultimately, that's true for every one of us. And you know, whatever weakness we may have, ultimately, we own it. And ultimately, we have mm-hmm. to decide, do we truly want to follow Christ? And do we truly want to become like him? Whether that's forsaking whatever it may be, pornography or, you know, whatever it might be, becoming kinder, more gentle, you know, more humble. It, we own it. Nobody else does. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess that's why that's probably the first um, the first habit, I guess, because that's that's probably the biggest roadblock to learning the other six habits, I guess, is, you Completely. know, if they, under, if they understand, I, I guess now we can see. I mean, I love I love the seven habits. There, there were a lot of aha moments for myself in reading that book. And I absolutely understand why it, it was such a bestseller still probably is, I would imagine. Yeah, um, it continues to, to be a bestseller <laughs> every <yeah>. week. <laughs> Well, because it's taken so many truths, eternal truths, you know, but put them in a way that anybody can understand, even, you know, a prisoner. I mean, somebody who's had just a very abnormal experience in life can still take these in and get on the right path. I love I love the truth of that. So I, I do have a question, though, about so you're talking about how they blame everybody. This does seem to be a really popular idea today. Is sort is. of celebrating victimhood, right? I mean, we mm-hmm. we're, we're we're taught mm-hmm. to we just you know we've talked a lot about identity here, and you know, like we we want to see how many how many ways like how many ways can I be a victim? You know, <laughs> there's you know intersectionality. So there's a lot of things we want to find a reason to be a victim and name it and pet it and you know raise it and 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 just put it all out there for that almost our victimhood becomes identity for some people right and so how do we avoid that temptation to 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 not get there because as you know we can see where that can end you right if if these people are coming in fully with this idea of being a victim how do we avoid that and maybe teach our children otherwise yeah you're exactly right linda i mean they not only uh, inmates and that population, but we ourselves within society. And I would, I would dare say that as Americans and really throughout the world, I've seen it that we've become victims and we love to be victims. We love to (laughs) blame everybody else, Mm -hmm. you know, politics. If you look at that, we're so divided and, you know, you'll see one party that will blame the other and vice versa And they're always casting blame rather than really ownership or really owning the problem. And so Mm -hmm. it's prevalent throughout. It it shows up in the form of lawsuits. You know, we're truly a litigious type society where we want to blame everybody else. We want to uh, hold them accountable, but not ourselves. So with the inmates and, and with all of us, it's just recognizing that we own it. We're responsible. One of the concepts within the seven habits that I I really love is this. It's the stimulus response concept where, you know, in the past, you'd have Pavlov's experiments where you have a stimulus and a response immediately follows. You know, it's that meat, bell, salivate, meat, bell, salivate. And the Mm -hmm. dog, you'd take away the meat, you'd ring the bell and the dog would still salivate. So you'd have an immediate response colliding with the stimulus. And so all, all habit one teaches is this simple concept that we all know. And it's this, you've got to separate stimulus from response. And in there, within that space, you have this one opportunity to determine your response. And it really is your response ability is what we like to call it. Hmm. And we can all pause, whether it's, you know, being upset with a family member, our husbands, our wives, our children, 
you know, we often react immediately rather than pausing for a moment and just determining how we're going to respond because we all have that choice and really what we would call that freedom to choose our response. And, and we own that completely. But, you know, I found that serving in bishoprics and so forth where family members, I had one, one particular person, he was a man within our ward and they were struggling within their marriage. He would come home and he'd see the house completely destroyed. They had four young kids and she was trying her best just to manage the home. And the first thing he would do is he would either get very upset and very angry and he'd start cleaning up, but he'd start doing it out of anger. And I shared with him just this one thought of creating a pause, a space between the stimulus, you know, all the chaos of the home and his response and just calm down. And the very first thing you need to do is just go love on your wife. She's had to be with them the whole darn day you know, go hug on her and talk with her, whatever you need to do, but just listen and change your response. And so we, we face this same dilemma in everything we do, but ultimately we have to create that window between stimulus and response and choose our response. And we can all do it. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all principles within the gospel, frankly, nothing's new. It's just being cognizant of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Kind of taking control and just, just being more intentional, you know, just trying to yeah. make specific choices for specific reasons. And yeah, that's really interesting. I'm glad you shared that. You talked a little bit, you know, before um, and shared that you had some very interesting statistics um, that you could maybe share. Uh, we'd love to hear about those. And, and I think those would be very interesting. I think it will be. It's really fascinating. You know, what most people don't realize is 96, 97 percent of all inmates, all offenders, someday they are going to be released. There's only about three percent of the population that's incarcerated right now that's going to remain in prison for their whole lives. So really, these other 97 percent, they are with us. They will be with us. They are our neighbors, you know, we just don't know it. And, and thankfully, we don't know it, you know, hopefully they're living a very good life. But I'll share some really interesting statistics. We did a study not too long ago that was comparing officers, you know, that are working within a prison and offenders that are living within the prison. And what was so startling is that they're so similar. I'll just share a few with you. Divorce rates, as an example, for the officers, they were 75%. Now, the norm within America is about 50. I think it's gone down just recently below 50%. Mm -hmm. And then yet for inmates, and this would not surprise you, but their divorce rate is 80%. So really quite high. And then as you look at substance abuse, for officers, they had a substance abuse rate of about 36% really quite high. And then for offenders, it was 43%, even on the inside within prisons. Finally, uh-huh. a few other statistics that are that are kind of shocking. And this one was disturbing. Within the United States, our suicide rate, now I believe it's gone up with COVID, but our suicide rate is generally about 10 people for every 100,000 people. Well, on the inside with officers, it's actually 17 for every 100,000. And then for inmates, it's 18 for every 100,000. So it's really pretty high. It's, you know, for inmates, it's almost double the amount that it is for normal Americans. And it just tells us they live in such a stressful environment. But the real kicker, the one that um, I think stunned me and it disturbed me more than anything else was the average length or their lifespan. On on average, the typical correctional officer lives to be 66 years of age. Hmm. And the average offender lives only to be 64 years of age. Well, as Americans, we typically live to be 78.2 years of age. So we've got 
anywhere from 12 to 14 years on top of what a typical correctional officer would have. In fact, um, most of them, gosh, um, most correctional officers after retirement, they only live on average 18 months. My goodness. Oh, wow. Which is horrific, isn't it? And so we joke and they joke, well, if you want to know the secret to that, to that don't retire. <laughs> and wow. Of course, who's going to do that? You know, someday we all want to retire, but you know, for them, it's uh, it's a matter of life and death, genuinely. So, all we can get at is this: when we when we did the study, and we really thought, why in the world is this happening? You know, what's happening to our families? What's happening to these individuals? And we came to the conclusion that it's really it's the culture that's killing them. You know, they're all living kind of inside one Petri dish, two very different cultures, but that culture is killing them. So there's some really crazy and startling statistics, but um, also know this, that there's change happening too. And and there's some really encouraging statistics that I'll share with you too at, at some point here. It's very hopeful to know that these habits are helping people feel like that maybe when they do, like I said, 97% of them eventually will rejoin society, do so with a sense of hope that maybe they can do something different the second time right? and, 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 and apply those principles and change. And, and that's, that's a very hopeful thought. Yeah, completely. And in fact, in essence with that, that whole essence of hope, which, you know, you look at the gospel and you look at Christ and I look towards the resurrection and, you know, the life after that there really is a life after death. And it's really just that substance of hope, you know, and belief. And and I'm so grateful for that. With the inmates, uh, I'll just share this, uh, this final statistic with you. I don't want to kill you with too many stats, but, (laughs) but, (laughs) but this one might be of interest, you know, on a whole, each prison system, it varies by number or by prison system, but it's simply this, Many people have not heard of the word recidivism. Well, recidivism just means how many of these inmates, when they're released, end up back in prison. And it's pretty shocking because so many of them do. And on average, most prison systems have a recidivism rate of between 50 to 70 percent. Some are between 35 to 55 percent. And what that really means is this. These people, you know, these sons and daughters of of a God, of a father, are ending back in prison two to three years later or in a jail. You know, about 55% do. And so that's that's kind of scary. But what we found that for those that begin applying these principles, which really are gospel principles, it cuts that recidivism rate down from 50, 55% down to about 8%. Wow. Oh, wow. That's huge. It was pretty big. It's not a, you know, it's not a panacea for all things. Christ is the only panacea for everything, but it's a start. Mm -hmm. It helps get them on the path. So, so Jeff, you work in this and it's what we would call probably an extreme environment, right? You're, you're, you're teaching these principles and whatnot. And I think the average person and our average listener probably has not, like you said, spent time in a prison or gone to prisons. And you know, I'm sure there's a process to even be involved in any level in teaching people in prisons and having that constant contact like you do. So how do we turn this? How do we bring this home to the average listener? How do we apply some of the principles you're talking about in our homes and in relation to the second paragraph? And, and really learning to love our neighbors and how, how do we teach our children about, we talked about, you know, judgment and discerning and some of those things and how kind of bring it home, I guess, is what we're asking. How do we bring it home? Yeah. And I, I love that thought because, you know, this does no good if we don't apply it to ourselves just within <laughs> our homes. You know, it's right. one thing to be in a prison, but most of us are at home and hopefully our homes aren't prisons. You know, (laughs) that's the goal (laughs) emotionally and spiritually. And and so I'll just share two simple things. One is uh, regarding habit two, which is 
It's called Begin with the End in Mind. And really, it's all about vision. And how I'd relate that to you is this. It's really just finding our unique purpose in life. What God, what our Father has really placed us on earth to fulfill. And it's more uh, an act of discovery than anything else. It's not an act of creation. It's really discovering what that unique purpose is, what that mission is. And I feel like our patriarchal blessings are just that, you know, just to be very brief with it. But I remember when I did get my patriarchal blessing at college, here I came and I was fasting and I was praying and everything to get some inspiration. I'd finally gotten to the point where I wanted it. I was 18 or 19. And I went into a man who I had never seen before in my life. He didn't know me. He didn't know my family. He didn't know anything. And I didn't know him. And yet what unfolded in the next, whatever it was, five to 10 minutes was my mission statement, my uh, unique purpose here on earth. And it gave me that guiding star, that light, that North star to really guide my whole life. And what's so interesting about it, and this is years and years later, I finally, you know, through the seven habits, I created my own mission statement as a part of really determining what's my vision for me? Who am I really? What's my true unique mission here on earth? And what are those missions? And when I finally came up with it and I drafted it and I felt like, hey, this, this really is me. The funny thing about it is every point that I had in my mission statement, I could also find in my patriarchal blessing. And so, you know, it's like, duh, you know, there it is right there it's been with you all these years. And, you know, you just had to put it in your own words. And so my own personal mission statement, I have a, a tangible thing that represents it. And it's the North Star. And if you can picture a, a star, the North Star, you've got four main legs, you know, the two legs, one on the top, one on the bottom, they're longer than the others. And the other two on the sides, each one of those points represents a key thing for me, my unique mission. And, and when I come down to it, it's really this. It's eternal life. You know, I, I want to be I want to become like Christ because it's really all about becoming. And so it's loving God with all my heart, which means I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to screw up and I'm going to mess up. but I'm Doggone it, I'm going to keep on striving. I'm going to pick myself up and try and try again. It's nurturing my family. And, you know, there's a lot more depth to that than I'll share, but it's having integrity. Things like that that really re represent each one of the legs of my star. But every one of those items can be found within my patriarchal blessing. And so I, I would really encourage anybody who hasn't gotten one to get one, but to prepare to get it, to go into it fasting and praying, to really truly want it. Because I know this, God told me things that, you know, our father told me things that only I knew. Even my parents did not know that. So first I, I'd go that route. And if you've already got your blessing, your patriarchal blessing, read it again. I, you know, just about three months ago, I, I, how many times have we read our blessings? Countless times, right? Mm -hmm. And I've thought, well, you know, I've accomplished all of them or they've come to pass. And then just about three, four months ago, I, I read it again. And one statement just stood out to me completely differently from how I had interpreted it before. And I realized, wow, this is such a living document. It just goes on and on throughout my whole life. So but habit one is so key, just knowing, here's what I'm really trying to say. Seeing yourself, how God sees you, how our Heavenly Mother sees us. You know, the thought of a Heavenly Mother, and one that truly uh, cares about me and a Heavenly Father, that changes everything. But it's us getting that glimpse of how they see us because they see us for who we truly are and who we can genuinely become. That's a game changer, not only for inmates, it's, 
it's a life changer for us. So that's one. I, I'll share one other one with you, but I don't want to just keep on yapping. Um, other thoughts or questions you've got? Maybe just before you go to that second one, I just wanted to thank you for sharing that. I think that a lot of time when we look at that second paragraph in the proclamation and we see that each person has a divine uh, you know, identity and potential, that a lot of the time we, we look outward on that and we think, you know, I need to do better at loving people and I need to do, which, which is not a bad thing. I think that we should absolutely do those things. But I love that you brought it home to, we have to recognize our own divine potential. We have to recognize uh, how God sees us um, probably as a prerequisite to being able to help other people on that path. Um, and so I really want to thank you for sharing that. I think that really brought it home for me. Yeah, definitely. It's so true. It's like that old uh, quote by Ralph Waldo Emerson, where he said, you know, what lies behind you and what lies before you pales into comparison to with what lies within you. Hmm. And it's just us discovering how, you know, our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Mother really do view us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. There's one other area I don't know if you want it just to make it a little bit more applicable and and practical. Oh, we want it. We definitely it. want it. <laughs> it. It's really habit five, which is seek first to understand, then seek to be understood. And it's really just this: listen first. We're all so good at talking, and you've probably known people, and maybe you've even caught yourself doing this where when you're visiting with someone and you're in a conversation, you're constantly preparing your retort or you're constantly repair, preparing what you're going to say and how you're going to reply instead of pausing and just listening. And it's one of those areas that, uh, you know, inmates, they have often credited this as being the one thing that has restored trust in their relationships with their spouses their kids, whoever it may be, even officers. But I'll just share with you very briefly a, an experience and trying not to be too vulnerable. But, you know, we've, I'm married to Sally. We've been married, um, I think, <laughs> I better remember this, right? <laughs> so, Come on, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. And we've got four kids. We, we love them dearly three boys, one girl. And with one of our boys, we just had struggled and struggled and struggled. And by about age nine, he kind of went dark on us. And it became so difficult within our home. And none of us understood it. By the time he was 12, you know, we're a pretty vivacious, happy family. Very positive. Um, outwardly so as well. And, you know, they'd come down and they'd say, good morning. And I'd say, good morning. And there's got a, a ray of enthusiasm about it. Well, this particular son would come down and I'd say, good morning with, you know, some zest. And he would growl, you know, just basically, <laughs> you know, mutter. And just like, would you just shut up? I don't want to hear any happiness right now whatsoever. <laughs> and it went on. And to make a really long story short, this was painful. It was really hard. He'd gone dark on us for years and years, and it carried on to about the age 16 and 17. And we didn't know what to do. We did go to counseling, and it helped a teeny bit, not completely. I'll share this with you. We put so much prayer, so much fasting into it. And uh, here's what happened. I had about three key moments that came to me, and it was really just the Holy Ghost talking to me. And one of them, I'll just share one, and it was this, just listen. Shut up and listen. Now, the Spirit didn't say shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I interpreted it, I better shut up and just listen. And it hit me over the head like a two by four. And so I began looking for opportunities to just listen, to just talk. But for my part, to listen. And I couldn't find them. In fact, uh, it would snow. And my wife would say, well, I told her about this impression I had. And she said, well, go drive him to go drive him to school. It's snowy. He's driving a truck. Use that as an excuse. Well, I'd drive him to school. And it was the quietest, 
most awkward and uncomfortable 10 minutes that we'd ever had. Nothing would work until one thing finally happened. I love competitive volleyball and he does too. And he just got really good at it by himself. And we began playing pepper, which with pepper, it's uh, bump, set, spike. And if you're really good, you can do it in a controlled manner anywhere. And we began doing that in our, in our family room. <laughs> My wife, <laughs> Linda, you can imagine this. You can appreciate it. She was not happy. <laughs> you know? and, uh, but then what I found was this. He would begin to open up and he'd just start talking. He'd start complaining about a teacher or something else. And my natural inclination was to, of course, correct him and say, oh, I'm sure that teacher doesn't mean ill. But then I'd quickly catch myself. Or I should say, the spirit would catch myself and say, just listen. You don't have to judge him. You don't have to comment. All you've got to do is understand. All you've got to do is seek to truly understand this great young man who's in your presence and in your home. And so we began to do that, and I would shut up, and I would just listen. And every time we'd play Pepper in the family room, he'd open up and talk and talk and talk. It was golden. And that one thing, you know, the Holy Ghost first and foremost, but then that one practice began to turn everything for me and my son. But the one learning that I had out of it was, was really this. The fault did not lie with him. The fault lied with me. It rested fully on my shoulders. I was not listening. I was not understanding where he was coming from. And to this day, we still talk and he talks a lot when we play Pepper. You know, Sally gets frustrated with us doing it in the family, but now she knows why we do it. And she says, go for it. Do it all you want, you know, whatever you want to do. I've come to realize the grandeur of his soul and the grandeur of his spirit, how courageous he is and what a great young man and what a great son of God he is. I'm so proud of him. So, you know, if there's one thing to say, in relationships, whether it's with a spouse, um, whether it's with a son or a daughter, whoever it may be, just listen. Just seek to understand and just shut up because it'll, <laughs> it'll prove yeah. it may be the whole turning point for your relationship. So just a little thought. Well, wow, that's a powerful story, Jeff. Thanks for sharing that with us. You You're know, Jeff, welcome. I've heard you speak a number of times over the years and I, yeah, you know, I don't always remember everything I hear, but I, you always tell such beautiful stories that help get a point across that I have remembered over the years. And I appreciate your ability to teach these concepts. And, and, and I think that these these inmates that you work with are very lucky to, to be able to partake of your wisdom and your experience. And, and just thank you so much for being with us today. I know you are. I, I know personally that you are a very busy man um, and you fit a lot in your schedule. But thank you so much for taking the time with us today. It's a blessing just to share this moment with the two of you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And I think that us, as well as everyone listening, has been able to grasp a deeper understanding of divine destiny and, you know, not just in others, but also in ourselves. And, and we thank you for that and are so grateful for taking so much time to be with us today. And, uh, and we wish you the best and we're so grateful for everything that you've said to us today. So oh, thanks, Jeff. You're welcome. What a blessing it is to be a member of the church, isn't it? It is. It is. And we hope to have you back. Well, it's a joy. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you both. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Raising Family Podcast. This episode was produced by Carol Rice. Our research coordinator is Angela Fallentine. Audio was edited and mixed by John Wright. The Raising Family Podcast is brought to you by thefamilyproclamation.org.